All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I've been watching on social media some incredible images of, of rainbows and beautiful skylines and all sorts of Space Needle images. And I just want to start by saying that this is really a glorious day. And we are making such incredible progress across the state of Washington and across this country. And uh, we are absolutely uh, working in the right direction. And so I just wanted to start by saying thank you to all of you, but also recognizing where we are going and how successful we have been thus far. But we are nowhere near out of this pandemic. We are still have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, but I will tell you in the in the last several months, we have made incredible amount of progress. And I just want to thank again, all of you, our media partners for being on with us every single week. With We know this is not easy. And I really want to thank all of you for championing the messages to our community members. I also want to thank uh, Reverend for joining us today. Uh, it is it is an honor to have you. We had the opportunity to visit with your team uh, at uh, New Beginnings Church yesterday, and uh, we're going to talk about that as well. And what I loved about uh, the vaccine activities and efforts that, that your team was engaged in was that every time somebody was getting vaccinated, they would come through. And we were having a conversation. All of a sudden, people started clapping and, and a plotting and we didn't know what was going on. So every single person that gets vaccinated, they get a, a standing ovation. And, you know, I think uh, that is incredible. And uh, of course, I, I had to whoop it up a little bit more because, I, you know, as Secretary of Health, I wanted to bring a lot of energy. So I just wanted to say thank you to, to you and your team. Um, let me start with uh, some additional where uh, trends on where we are. As we know, all counties moved to phase three of the reopening yesterday as disease activity can, uh, continues to show either flattening or decline statewide. And this is something that's really critical for all of us to, to keep in mind. Um, we, we, we do know that COVID continues uh, to afflict communities across the state of Washington, and we have had over 424,000 confirmed and probable cases of COVID-19, and, and unfortunately, over 5,650 deaths. And I think that is really something that we continue to watch, continue to monitor, and that really does concern us, that this is a disease that has, has really uh, taken hold in our nation, and we've got to do everything we can to continue to, to fight it. Transmission continues to decline, but we're still seeing our, uh, our coefficient close to one uh, at the end of April. We want to continue to see that below one for a substantial period of time. And certainly, we are seeing the decline and flattening flattening and decline in case counts and hospital admissions statewide that began in early May, which is the reason that Department of Health made the recommendation to the governor's office and Governor Inslee, as you all know, went ahead and um, uh, made the adjustments on the reopening uh, plan as, as was highlighted last week. Declining and flat trends in most counties is critical to the work that we're doing. And we wanna make sure that people do not forget all the practices that go in place to getting us here, which includes making sure if you um, have been exposed to someone with COVID-19 or have symptoms, you get tested. And certainly all the three W's that, that really continue to be part of this, although there have been adjustments on wearing the mask outdoors, especially, uh, and also for indoor uh, wearing of masks, but we really want to make sure that people still do everything they can to continue to help drive these these case and uh, and and uh, hospitalization trends either flat or what we want to see is downward. So. The case rates and hospital admission rates are declining or flattening across all ages. And if we could show that graphic up one more time, I want to just make sure that everybody is is seeing the same thing at the same time about what we are uh, hopeful for will continue in the state of Washington. As you can see here that this, um, oh, not this one, the one before this. There you go. So as you can see that we are we are making incredible progress. And if you look at the at the uh, the trends um, moving forward, 
as we're seeing with complete data and even the projected projection moving forward is that we uh, believe that we are seeing that flattening and that decline uh, at the very right of this graph when it comes to cases uh, throughout the state of Washington. That does not mean that every place you're having the same kind of decline, and we want to make sure that that is emphasized, that we want people to really know what's happening in their local community, and that's why local health departments, our local health partners are so critical to the process of understanding what's happening in your local context. I do want to continue to remind people of the importance of vaccines. If we can now show the next graphic. This is something that we have um, shown over the last uh, couple of uh, sessions, and I do want to highlight what we have been saying here uh, on, on a, a couple of different occasions. Uh, two weeks ago, as you know, we were talking about what's on the right side of this graph related to hospitalization rates uh, for those who are over the age of 65. And again, as you can see, that if if an individual is over the age of 65 and fully vaccinated, which is represented by the, the green line, uh, comparing that to the red line of unvaccinated, that there is a 10 time higher risk of being hospitalized if you are unvaccinated and over the age of 65, 65 and over. However, I also want to continue to highlight what we showed last week, which is hospital admission rates for unvaccinated individuals that are between the ages of 45 and 64. This is, again, those who are between the ages of 45 and 64. It is even more dramatic that there is an 18 time higher risk of hospitalization if you're if you're unvaccinated than fully vaccinated in that same group. And that just reminds us that this is not only a situation where people in younger populations need to worry about those who are seniors or elderly, but also be thinking about their own health and the health of those around them. And so I do want to make sure that we emphasize that again. Um, we continue to have a lot of information on our DOH data dashboard. I will, I, I do want to make this comment that over this coming weekend, we're doing some archiving and we will not be updating our dashboard over the weekend. And so please just be, if you're, if you're, uh, I know many of our media partners look at that dashboard on a daily basis. You will not see that over this coming weekend, uh, but we hope to resume that next week once we get that archiving completed. As we move into vaccines, we'll show the graphic that we've been discussing uh, over, whoops, the uh, three-legged stool. Um, if we could go back to that one, just a reminder of the importance of the three-legged stool. And uh, again, supply, logistics, and demand. Uh, we do believe that we have adequate supply for the demand uh, that is within the state of Washington, that if you are someone who wants to get vaccine and are eligible to get vaccine, meaning ages 12 and up, uh, you are able to get vaccine and hopefully very close to where you live. But in addition to that, that means that we've done a tremendous job across the state with all of our partners on the ground doing things every single day to assure the logistics are in place to be able to be uh, receptive and uh, the ability to provide for vaccines across the state of Washington. But this, this last leg of the stool of demand is what we are watching very closely. We are seeing that variability in demand, whether it's softening of demand in some communities or whether it's declining de demand in other communities or whether it's just the demand has been um, variable in other communities. We are watching this closely and certainly doing everything we can, not just for mass vaccination efforts, but pivoting towards more uh, focused uh, actions that are going to allow us to get into communities and really approach uh, the, the actions in a very robust way, but also uh, community by community and really working with our partners. Uh, very shortly, DOH is going going to be uh, releasing, over, it's probably about a week away, uh, more information about how we are planning to work with our partners on the ground to do community outreach ourselves. And this is going to be a really exciting 
uh, set of activities that DOH is going to be engaged in with our local partners, in including our community-based organizations, and uh, please be on the lookout for that. If I could show the next slide, this is really about the progress that we're making, and I know Michelle Roberts is going to be talking about this in more detail, so I'm just going to give a very high-level um, look at this that, you know, we have really administered over 6.3 million doses and counting. I mean, it's very possible that we're already at six and a half million doses by the time I, I, I'm giving these remarks right now. And and well over um, the the 83% of the doses that have been delivered to the state of Washington have been uh, administered, which is also fantastic. But I want to also highlight what you see in the bottom here, which is that we have two point, almost 3 million people, 2.9 million people who have been fully vaccinated above the age of 16 um, years of age. And we have um, this really translating to almost half of our population that is fully vaccinated. I think that is really a testament to the work that we are doing, but we want to continue to move forward uh, in, a, in a way that we do not slow or lose the momentum that we have built uh, over the last several months. Uh, this has been a great week in doing that. I've had a chance to, to really be out and about and have uh, visited quite a few events and activities and partners so I want to uh, thank uh, the Faith Action Network uh, for convening us yesterday, but also I wanted to give a shout out to Pastor Braxton with the New Beginnings Church, and he was fantastic and and just really highlighting a lot of the different activities that, uh, by the way, he has a podcast uh, every Wednesday I learned about yesterday as well, and uh, he highlights uh, health and vaccines of late and really how to fight this pandemic. Uh, Pastor Braxton also described the importance of someone in his family getting uh, COVID-19, and only de then did people uh, really take it seriously, and I think that is something that that I you know took um, uh, to heart. Of course, uh, there are other people that we have been meeting, and one was Carmen Gaden, who is with Windermere Real Estate. Uh, and, you know, I will tell you, Carmen shared a similar story as Pastor Braxton about, again, somebody in her family uh, who was saying, I'm not going to get vaccinated. And at the end of the day, for her to do everything she can to try to convince that individual. But it wasn't until somebody really um, uh, got COVID-19 that people started to take it seriously. We also met Mr. Pir uh, Chishti at Maza Grill in Kent, and he shared how vaccines were so important for him, his wife, and his staff at the restaurant. And he saw that this was an opportunity for the, the restaurant now to, to be able to, to really start to serve its customers. And really, uh, while they still wear masks, it was really important for them to, to feel that they had uh, additional protection from this horrible virus. And finally, at the um, ARTH ministry, as you're going to hear from the Reverend shortly, African Americans Reach and Teach Health Ministry, the activity that we had in New Beginnings Church, we heard from Dr. Jocelyn Thomas, who's a nurse practitioner there. And what she was really describing was really how people are hesitating to get vaccine. But then when they start to put the whole equation together of that they are protecting themselves and they do not want to put their loved ones or the, themselves at risk, that's what what really at the end of the day makes them come in for vaccine. And it was great when we were there yesterday to see 16 years of age and older adolescents who were also getting vaccinated, which was fantastic. And they were really surprised when they were getting the uh, standing ovation. Let me tell you, adolescents uh, don't always uh, go do so well when, when somebody is clapping when they get, when they get a shot. So, um, you know, we have, um, Again, just done a tr such a tremendous job across the state. Uh, we are very close to 50% uh, of our total state population with at least one dose. Uh, as we know, to fully reopen and stay open, uh, we have June 30th that the governor has set, but he wants to see 70% of the people 16 years of age with at least one dose in, and we're currently at about 59%. And I would think that we, we're actually probably right at 60%. So we're very close to, to where we are as well. Um, the last few things I want to really talk about again 
is the fact that we are again watching what's happening with our adolescents. Uh, we are looking at how we're doing compared to across the country, and I think there's been an incredible amount of interest in the state of Washington for the, those 12 to 15 and their parents to to get their children vaccinated. And we're we're really going to describe that when Michelle makes her remarks. And then I do want to uh, pivot to. Uh, the fact that we have updated our mask order. And I wanna really uh, highlight a few things as we update our mask order. And, and Lacey Fehrenbach is on and she can certainly talk about this as well during the Q&A, but we're highlighting and updating our materials um, but I think the key message is that fully vaccinated people do not need to wear masks in most situations. That doesn't mean in all situations, but in most situations, vaccines work. And if you're vaccinated, you're protected and you do not need to wear a mask, especially outdoors. Now, that doesn't mean that people aren't going to be wearing masks. And I, I just don't want to see people being shamed for wearing a mask. And we're you know, starting to see some of those reports, including it was in the New York Times just yesterday, people saying that they're wearing a mask, they're fully vaccinated, they feel comfortable wearing a mask after so many months, behaviorally speaking, and just getting used to having a mask on, and then people um, saying, why do you have your mask on? And we don't want to see that. If people want to wear a mask, we would encourage them to continue to be able to do so, and we certainly don't want to have any situation where people are, are um, uh, shamed into uh, or peer pressured into not wearing their masks. And we know that there are exceptions for, especially some um, indoor settings, healthcare settings, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, schools, etc. But also we want to make sure that if you are unvaccinated, you are not protected. If you are unvaccinated, you are not protected and you should and you have to keep wearing your mask. But here's the message that I want everybody to hear is we want people to respect the rules of the room you're in respect the rules of the room you're in. That means that counties and businesses can make their own rules about masking. So if you walk into an establishment and they say, we are requiring you to wear a mask, that you should respect that rule. We want everybody to respect the rules and to know the rules that are within their local context. We are also working with LNI and certainly the governor's office behind the scenes, and we're going to be issuing some additional guidance by the end of this week when it comes to workplace and other um, rules and and. Uh, guidelines for what the state is expecting of uh, businesses and establishments across the state, and that will be by the end of the week. I also want to say one other thing, which is that we know there are some people who cannot get vaccinated. That includes kids. So we've got my, my wife and I, we have an 11-year-old, 7-year-old, 4-year-old. You know, we, I talk about this a lot, that none of them are eligible to get vaccinated. When they see mom or dad who are, by the way, both vaccinated, fully vaccinated, if we're in the car and about to drive somewhere and we don't put our masks on, one, they ask us once we're about to park and get out, where are your masks? Why do you not that ha have them on? And number two, we want to model the right behaviors for them. So while we are fully vaccinated, I want to have those masks on so that our kids also feel comfortable keeping their masks on. And I want to make sure that parents are keeping that in mind as well. This is so critical. This is so difficult for parents. Parents, many are vaccinated themselves fully, and yet their kids are not. We want them also to continue to champion, model good behaviors for their kids. And that's what we're doing in our family. And I hope that other Washingtonians do that as well. And let me just close by saying, the partners throughout the state are continuing to work proactively to reach people at highest risk, facing barriers. We are certainly seeing that communities that have been harder and work, that the, the worsening of existing health inequities are, are really the work that all of us need to be doing together. And when you hear from Reverend Mary Diggs Hobson, she's going to be really talking about some of those successes and challenges on the ground. Again, the reminder, don't hesitate, vaccinate. You know, getting 
our, our kids and our, our parents and our adults and communities vaccinated now means we have a safer and, and more close, as close to normal of a summer as we can. We are seeing light that's getting brighter at the end of this long, dark tunnel that we've been. So please continue to work together. Let's make the vaccine choice the right choice. Please encourage others to get vaccinated. Vaccine providers, please encourage those who have just gotten vaccinated. For example, at New Beginnings Church, we mentioned to our nurse practitioner colleague, we said, hey, as soon as those people are getting the standing ovation, they should be right on the, back in the neighborhood trying to get others to come back in to get vaccinated as well. So standing ovation for not just getting vaccinated, but for to encourage someone else to get vaccinated and to bring a friend. So we're in this together. We're making incredible progress. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Again, Again, I want to just say that we are making that progress, but we can only do this if we continue to work together. And so with that, Frangie, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Secretary Shaw. Next, we'll go to Assistant Secretary Michelle Roberts. Well, thank you, Secretary Shaw, and good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Roberts, and I lead the COVID-19 vaccine planning and distribution team for the Department of Health. Our state continues to make progress. So we can get the graphic up. Um, more than 6.3 million doses of vaccine have been given out over the past five months. So 59% of people 16 and older have gotten the first dose of vaccine. This means that most of us who are eligible are choosing to get vaccinated. 47% are fully vaccinated. And on to the second graphic about our state mass um, vaccination clinics. The good news is we've given out more than 290,000 doses of vaccine at our state mass vaccination clinic. We're also off to a strong start with adolescent immunization. Over the first four days that vaccines were, um, that 12 to 15 year olds were eligible in our state, nearly 28,000 people between the ages of 12 and 15 years of age have received their first dose of Pfizer vaccine. That's tremendous. And when you do the math, that adds up to 7.4% of all 12 to 15 year olds in our state, which is more than double the national vaccine average for that new, nearly um, newly eligible group. group. I'm so proud of these vaccination numbers. This is proof our state is stepping up. So thank you to all those parents who are already out there getting their 12 to 15 year olds in our state vaccinated. We are protecting our children and our communities by getting them the COVID vaccine. We know the Pfizer vaccine has proven to be safe and extremely effective for everyone eligible. Across the country, close to 150 million doses of Pfizer vaccine have been administered. My 12 year old daughter already got her first shot as well. As a mother, I'm breathing a sigh of relief. I know this vaccine will help protect her, give her fr the freedom she is deserving and wanting to spend time with her friends, maybe get back to a sleepover and get back to doing all the things she loves and give me a peace of mind when she's doing that. If your kids get their first dose of vaccine this week, they'll be fully vaccinated right around the time summer break begins. We're still learning what the long-term side effects of COVID-19 disease might be for children, which is another reason to get them vaccinated. If you have younger kids um, under, um, under the age of 12, getting your older children and yourself vaccinated helps protect the entire family. And another piece of great news, the CDC now says that people can get the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time they get other vaccinations. This makes getting vaccinated even more convenient, especially for kids. This means one less trip to the doctor's office and they can get caught up on all their school vaccinations at the same time. If you have questions, visit our FAQ page or talk to your healthcare provider. Once you're vaccinated, it's important to keep track of your immunization record card. Some businesses and organizations are offering incentives for people um, who provide proof of vaccination. You can simply take a picture of your COVID-19 vaccination card. Or as we've shared before, we have a great tool that gives you an official verified proof of your COVID-19 vaccination online for free. It's called My IR for My Immunization Record. And the website is myirmobile.com. 
please keep in mind, getting verification to this website will take some time than when you first set it up. So please make sure you visit the website and get your certificate before you leave home to allow yourself some time to work through the process. It is not something you're gonna to wanna to set up the first time when you're in line um, to get one of those vaccine incentives. Until then, use the picture of your card in your um, on your device whenever you need it. We wanna tell you also about a creative strategy put in place this week to help make sure we use all the extra doses of vaccine up in our state. We started a new program for vaccine providers called Vaccine Marketplace. And it's set up just like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, but for our vaccine providers on our state's immunization information system. Here's how it works. If a provider has extra doses of vaccine, like 50 extra doses of Moderna that they won't use before they expire, they'll share that on the state's immunization marketplace where fellow providers can take a look. Before placing weekly vaccine orders, we're encouraging providers to check the vaccine marketplace to see if there's nearby vaccine available for them to use. This will help with vaccine transfers and reduced waits, which is a win-win for all of us. Our forecast this coming week from the federal government shows we will again be allocated about 385 doses of vaccine next week. This means we have plenty of vaccine to go around. We encourage everyone 12 and older to get vaccinated today. That way you can fully enjoy the summer safely and in most places mask free. Getting vaccinated is easier than ever. Head to the vaccine locator tool to make an appointment. You can text your zip code to get vax, which is 438-829 to receive address addresses of nearly available vaccine sites. We also have the help available via the phone so call our COVID-19 vaccination number, 833-VAX-HELP. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Roberts. Next, we'll go to Director Dan Laster. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. I just wanna spend a few minutes talking about how we're working to remove all barriers so that all Washingtonians can get vaccinated. And first I wanna just make sure that there is no misunderstanding to get vaccinated is free. It means you don't need to have insurance, you don't need an insurance card, you don't need to have a primary care physician. It is free, there are no charges. So to be clear, you can get vaccinated for free. Now that doesn't mean there aren't barriers that remain and that's what we're working really, really hard to remove for all Washingtonians. So I've spoken before about our efforts to get free transportation in place. And I am delighted last week, Spokane Transit announced that for one month from May 12th to June 12th, there will be free door-to-door -door service on their transit. And so it is an ideal time for anyone in the and transit region to get vaccinated. And uh, I do wanna thank our, our partners at Spokane Transit for looking out for the health of those in that region. I also wanna just again note that we have this phenomenal partnership with Uber and Lyft, and I strongly encourage uh, Washingtonians who are in need of transportation uh, to call our call center. And that number again is 1-833-VAX-HELP. So again, 1-833-VAX-HELP, there you have it. And uh, so really transportation, we want to break down that barrier. So again, there's no charge to get vaccinated and we don't want transportation needs to be a barrier. And lastly, I just note that Apple Health, uh, Medicaid in Washington, again, provides for free rides. So there are just many, many options and, and we're continuing the work, but I just want to flag that. The other area that I'm just pleased about the progress and uh, hope there will be more is employer incentives for employees. Um, so I really wanna just applaud and encourage our employers across the state to consider what might be appropriate incentives to enable employees to get vaccinated, to create an 
a, a healthier workplace. And so that can include paid time off. It can include time off in terms of recovery from vaccination. Uh, it can include transportation to a vaccination site or where appropriate on-site vaccination. And in that vein, uh, really do want to encourage, and I know this is happening uh, all over the state, but if employers want to have on-site uh, vaccination uh, pop-up clinics, we really encourage those and want you to be working with your local health jurisdiction. And if we can provide support at the Department of Health to make that happen, make the connections between providers who can come on site, we really, really encourage that. Uh, you know, the data does support that when it's easy in the workplace, not needing to take time off, coworkers, uh, that all leads to an esprit de corps to get vaccinated. So again, I really just want to thank uh, employers across the state for doing uh, what makes sense for their employees uh, in their workplace. And lastly, I just want to talk about business incentives generally. Again, I'm really excited to see how creative and innovative we are in the state of Washington. And uh, whether that be an entrance at a Mariners game, whether it be sections for public events for those who are vaccinated, uh, whether it's discounts on airfares, whether it is free beer, uh, gift cards, whatever it may be. And, and in this area, you know, businesses know their consumers best. And uh, really, we just applaud all the efforts that are being taken. You know, at the end of the day, good business aligns with public health because it leads to a healthy economy and a healthy Washington. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Director Laster. Next, we'll go to Reverend Mary Diggs Hobson. Okay. Good morning, and thank you for, for having me here today. Uh, it's really an honor to be here to share on behalf of, of ARTH, or African Americans Reach and Teach Health Ministry, and our COVID-19 vaccination clinic collaboration. Um, I just want to share briefly about our, our clinic and what makes us unique. We, we do consider ourselves to be a bit unique. What we, ARTH recognized in late 2020 that there would be a need to have some infrastructure in place in the community to help and assist in rolling out the vaccine, uh, particularly within our um, black and brown indigenous um, communities of color. And so we, we began discussions with uh, Fred Hutch with their uh, COVID-19 prevention network uh, and their uh, HIV trials network department, along with Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and New Beginnings Christian Fellowship Church to really talk about how could we bring, work together as partners to bring the vaccine into the community, uh, a community where we all recognize that because of you know, historical and existing institutional um, racism, structural racism and, and the determinants of health that BIPOC uh, um, individuals really required uh, us being at the table to help develop the strategies that would bring the vaccine into the community. And so um, in any work that's done in the community, it's just really important to note that uh, it requires a diverse group of individuals who are understand and value the culture and the historical experiences of BIPOC uh, uh, individuals. So we look for a place like New Beginnings where it is expansive, it's, it's right in the community, um, is very accessible. And um, we, need, we know that we need to demonstrate the culture of, uh, of those uh, uh, clients and individuals that we serve. And so we wanted to be able to not only uh, just uh, bring our, 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 our uh, community members in to get vaccinated, but we wanted to be able to greet them and to celebrate them. So it required really having a staff and volunteers who look like us uh, as people of color. Um, in terms of performance I, of to date, we started in February uh, with our first clinic and we considered a standing clinic as opposed to a pop-up clinic because there is some permanency to it. 
Uh, and that's important when you're working within communities of color to know that there is a place uh, that they can go to, one where there are is familiar, where there's their you know there's a trusting uh, relationship there. And so when we begin the clinic in, in February of 2020, what we can report today as of May 18 uh, is that we have vaccinated uh, over 5,000. Uh, individuals with 5,486 exactly. And we're very proud of that. Uh, of 58% of those uh, clients were, were African-American, 30% were people of, of, the, of color, and then 12% were, were white. And so there's, there's that range where we're trying to reach um, those who live in and around the community. And ranging from age of those who are less than 50, we just started on Tuesday, uh, with uh, vaccinating those who were 16 years old and above. We had, we were excited to see so many young people there. With, uh, whole, whole families were coming because they had to bring their parents and sisters and brothers and their friends. So it was, it was pretty lively and exciting. Um, in terms of successes uh, and some of the challenges and barriers that we've had or experienced, uh, I think uh, in terms of success, I, I think of an elder African-American elder. And it was just so um, wonderful just hearing the stories and witnessing the size, the size of relief uh, that was expressed and, get, and expressions of gratitude. You'd be amazed how many people have contacted us and just thanked us and in different ways, not just verbally, but in other ways. But then, you know, what I remember as I reflect back is um, there was an elder who was sitting on, uh, sitting and waiting and I walked up to him and he had tears in his eyes. He was crying because he said it was his first time being outside in over a year. And not only that, but he was able to see the faces of his friends who he had not seen in, in since March of last year. And so um, that's, you know, that just gives us the, um, the motivation, you know, to, to, to keep at this work. A grandmother who was, had had her vaccination and, and was she was our spokesperson. She was she was going to go back and tell her grandchildren that they needed to get vaccinated and why they needed to get vaccinated because if they wanted to be with her, they needed to be vaccinated. So that was their incentive. And so the one um, we've heard a lot about, you know, vaccine hesitancy, and what we found that is it's really important to understand why people are are hesitant to ask them personally the question why, because there's so many different reasons um, from social, cultural, and religious beliefs and practices to a need for uh, more education, uh, just to a lack, of, a lack of digital access or transportation. So there are all these different reasons that we need to understand and not, not really kind of label people um, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a category uh, of not being vaccinated or wanting to be vaccinated. Um, the one other thing that we, we found a challenge in is um, many of our elders did not have digital access and uh, to schedule their appointments, to go online. And, uh, our, you know, in terms of not only the digital access, but just the devices, the knowledge in terms of how to do that, the skills and how to do that. And what we developed, uh, we worked with King County uh, to get a grant and uh, we're able to purchase um, laptops and, and tablets, uh, provide those free to, uh, to uh, over 200 elders and, and also provide them with the training because it's one thing to have the laptop or the tablet, it's another thing to know how to use it. So we provided them with the training um, and um, not only for um, just uh, coming to register for the uh, vaccine, but how to use Zoom and Facebook uh, so they 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 learned how to do it because that was that really uh, enabled us to address the issue of mental health and mental wellness. When you have elders who have been away from family and who are now able to Facebook and and see their grandchildren and so on, so we saw that as a as something that was very needed as we addressed some of the issues of loneliness and uh, isolation uh, that that led to depression for so many of our elders. Um, the one thing that we also did, because 
um, mental illness and mental, I want to say mental health has been a big issue because of COVID. We found that, I think that's, the data shows that. Um, so we partnered with the National Alliance on Mental Illness to really help to educate our communities uh, about mental health and the resources that are available to them. And beyond that to how to become part of a support group so that they can really deal with, you know, internal family issues that uh, struggles uh, as they move through this, um, this pandemic. And so, you know, these, these are some of the, 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 the things that we have done over this past year that has helped us to really, um, I want to say, put a, a dent in the impact of COVID and in our, uh, in our communities. And one of the, uh, I just want to kind of finally say that uh, ARF recognizes that, you know, in healthcare, not everyone has the same opportunities for success. And so the history uh, of our people has taught us that due to systemic uh, disenfranchisement and uh, black and brown and indigenous people of color experience multiple challenges in the pursuit of, of quality health care. And so the work that we do uh, is to address these issues uh, and, and inequities that, that cause them. And so we seek to address inequity by working with a diverse uh, communities of funders and community partners, uh, health institutions uh, as well, to ensure that there's equitable service for those who uh, the system does not work for all the ways due to institutional and structural racism. And so this is, uh, this is who we are and we appreciate the time that you've allowed us to share this information today. Thank you, Reverend Diggs Hobson. Well, this brings us to the Q&A segment of today's briefing. We do have several media with questions today. If we're not able to get to your question, please reach out to us, doh-pio at doh.wa.gov. Our first question today comes from Jessamine with Q13. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciated. Um, and I, I, want, I know that Dr. Shah touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think businesses are curious about the guidance when it comes to masking or not masking. And I was wondering if you could provide some clarity on that because we're not sure whether to follow CDC's guidance or everyone's making their own decision. Do you have a recommendation to them? Thanks, Jessamine. And yeah, I, I think I was referring to that exact issue when I mentioned that by the end of this week, we're going to, uh, again, working with LNI and governor's office, uh, we're planning on issuing some additional guidance that'll provide some additional clarity for businesses. You know, I think ultimately from a public health standpoint, we want to, uh, again, respect the rules of the room and we want people that are going into those establishments to, if, if a business decides that they want to continue to require and, and you know especially with continuation of trying to get our vaccine rates up and and certainly cases are still higher than anybody wants to see uh, we certainly if businesses uh, have a mask requirement we want people to respect that and that is the public health way of looking at this and we have not changed that uh, from the beginning uh, we we do believe that masks work we also believe that vaccines work and so the combination of, of people getting vaccinated and certainly getting uh, keeping their masks on and you know I, I know my team knows this that I I carry my mask everywhere in fact our team does too uh, and and I am almost I've been as a healthcare provider, I've been vaccinated for four or five months, uh, maybe longer, I can't even remember now. And I, I, almost every instance, I will have a mask on. There are very few instances publicly that I won't have them on. And maybe outdoors, if I'm if I'm walking or, or no one is around or running or things of that nature, but I still feel comfortable, more comfortable to have a mask on uh, than, than not have it on, behaviorally speaking. So we will clarify some additional guidance by the end of this week, but just in general, we want people to respect what's happening in those establishments and certainly uh, within those local health jurisdictions. And again, we are going to support what's happening across the state of Washington. Ultimately, we want to protect people just as all of our local public health partners and health pro partners across the state want to. 
All right. Our next question comes from Mai with the Yakima Herald. Good morning. Um, my question is, um, so Dr. Shaw mentioned earlier that obviously looking at the local picture is important and looking at the Yakima County, um, we're doing pretty well. Our numbers have been declining. Actually, um, our numbers are both uh, the per 100,000 rate of new cases is actually below the state, which um, hasn't happened uh, much uh, during this pandemic. And so um, I guess my question is, is um, our, our vaccination rates, however, are below the state as far as the percentage initiated. So um, I think that would create some confusion among the public. Well, why are we seeing, you know, a, a declining trend that's below the state rate, but our vaccination rates below the state rate as well. So I was wondering if someone could respond to that. Yeah, I'm going to ask Lacey Fahrenbach to, to uh, make some comments. Let me just make a general comment that, you know, all of those ingredients that go into success, all of them are important. And we can't say uh, with absolute certainty in a novel virus of a pandemic that we have never seen before, at least uh, a global pandemic to the severity that we have not seen in a century, we cannot say exactly that it's this measure, that measure, the the you know the combination of these things the you know the lack of something else we just have to add all of that together and we know that's what really at the end of the day has success in community so with that uh comment in general Lacey, let me turn it over to you if you want to talk about uh some of the trends in you know in other parts of the state absolutely so I and mean, we are seeing he you know heterogeneity differences across counties or even smaller jurisdictions in our state in terms of uh, the trajectory of disease and the burden of disease, uh, case counts um, compared to vaccination rates. And as Dr. Shaw mentioned, there are multiple factors that contribute to this. So vaccines are a crucial, critical tool to slowing the spread, um, really preventing the spread of COVID-19 in our state. And certainly, you know, the one we've spent a lot of time on in recent briefings and months uh, but they're not the only factor. Uh, there's also all of those mitigation measures that we've been promoting for months, uh, wearing masks, watching your distance, keeping your social circle small. I would also say, you know, we're getting to the time of year where Washingtonians can spend and do spend a lot more time outdoors and outdoors is significantly lower risk for spread of disease. So that can be a factor. And then there's also, um, you know, in addition to vaccine, the acquired immunity of the of the community for among people who have had COVID-19. So all of those factors come together, and you know, disease grows or recedes based on um, interactions. And the more people are interacting, the longer those interactions are, the closer those interactions are, and the fewer vaccines um, or acquired immunity there is in the community, the higher the risk there is. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Steve with Como. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is a, a follow up to the first one regarding uh, the issue of mask guidance. And I think this is probably a question for Dr. Shaw, but I'm wondering if you could address the confusion uh, over the mask guidance. Um, I had a friend describe it to me last night as uh, somewhat of a mess. Um, there's, it's been a number of days, obviously, since the CDC updated its guidance. I know the state has adopted that. Uh, a number of counties have decided to keep certain restrictions in place. Others say they're not going to have updates until later on this week. And it's very confusing for people uh, to what it appears to be to have different messages depending on where you go and not really having a clear timeline of when each jurisdiction should make a decision or uh, update their guidance for what people should do in in where they're at. So I'm wondering if you could address that, just the overall confusion um, over what's taking place with the guidance. Yeah, and I, I, Steve, I, I tried to address it a couple of times, so perhaps uh, maybe I'm not as successful in addressing it, so I might have to turn that over to, to Lacey uh, or Michelle. But let me just say one, a couple of general things. Um, it, it is unfortunate uh, that, um, you know, as, as this pandemic has evolved, uh, we have gotten guidance from uh, our federal partners at the CDC, 
And, you know, it has been challenging when we do not have a heads up that that uh, guidance is about to come out. And let's be very frank, that's what happened here last week, is that we, we learned very quickly, just as all of you did, uh, that the CDC was updating guidance. Uh, that uh, is, um, Unfortunately, the way it happened, uh, it is inconsistent with how the CDC has operated in prior emergencies. We have usually, as state and local partners, we have received that information up front. We've been able to then review and we've been able to make appropriate decisions. Uh, when the CDC releases that information in the public sphere and then um, goes back to provide that information and then states and local public health partners like us are learning that at the same time that everybody else is, that's what leads to the confusion. And so we did our best, obviously, to follow in a, in a very difficult situation, follow the guidance of the CDC. And, uh, you know, you, you can see it both ways, right? If we had opted not to follow the guidance, then we would have been also people saying, well, why did you not follow the guidance? Because the CDC has issued them. So, you know, it's, it's really a no-win situation. And that's why it's so important for our federal partners. And we have shared this with them, not just myself, but other secretaries of health and other departments of health across the state, states across the country. We have shared with the CDC the fact that please give us as much notice so that we can then and appropriately adjust our policies and recommendations and also be able to clarify for what's happening in local communities. That said, we are where we are. And so we are, uh, like I said, by the end of this week, we will be issuing some additional clarification and guidance on what's gonna be happening uh, from our standpoint in establishments, what's expected. But I also will say that ultimately we, we do support those communities and those businesses, those establishments that want to continue to require masks. And I think one of the key messages that has been difficult is how do you operationalize the checking and the verification process of uh, someone who's vaccinated or not vaccinated. We certainly do not want people who are not vaccinated to game the system or to be dishonest and to say, yeah, I'm vaccinated and then show up in a in an establishment, again, if someone they're around is vaccinated, that person is protected. But we're concerned about having still unvaccinated people that are around them, or potentially, as I mentioned, my own kids who are at the, you know, under that that ability to be eligible, that they are now going to be unprotected except for the, you know, the wearing of the mask. And so it's so complicated, but I do want to make sure that everybody recognizes we're doing everything we can to clarify that, but also to work under the, you know, the the situation that was presented to us. Lacey, I, I think I went further and longer than I wanted to, to be comprehensive there, but I don't know if you or Michelle wanted to add anything. I think, you know, I think you covered it well. I think the important thing we want the public to understand and hear is that if you are fully vaccinated two weeks past your second dose of Pfizer and Moderna, two weeks past your only dose of Johnson & Johnson, you are very protected from that vaccine and very low risk to spread the disease. However, you know, we are still in the middle of the pandemic and the CDC director ha has said this as well, um, local leaders know their communities best and there, there are going to be communities where masks are still required. There are gonna be businesses that still require masks. And there are reasons as Dr. Shaw mentioned that people who are fully vaccinated may choose to wear a mask to protect uh, their family members or household members, their children. I'm, I'm just like Dr. Shaw. My children are not old enough to be vaccinated yet. And we wear, I'm fully vaccinated. My husband is. We wear masks wherever we go to model for our kids and protect them. Um, and, you know, this, this is going to be a transition time in the pandemic over the next uh, few weeks to months and uh, uh, confusing, but hopefully a positive transition as we're moving into recovery. All right, we do have a few more questions left and we are able to extend our time. Um, so we will be able to take a few more questions. And our next question comes from Nicole with Cairo Radio. Good morning, thank you for taking my question. 
Children can't get vaccinated yet. Young adults who became eligible on Vax Day are probably now just getting their second doses. I'm one of those people. I waited until I was eligible in late April and, and I'm just getting my second dose this week, yet I was at Costco and saw unmasked people, which was made me very uncomfortable. What do you say to people who say that mask guidance based around the honor system is this that this is premature that it puts these people who are not yet vaccinated at risk and that it could potentially lead to another wave uh so first of all nicole thanks for that and glad that you got vaccinated and you know you are uh, better protected uh, not fully protected but better protected uh after your first dose than uh, than otherwise and so um you know charge on and and you know what i would say to people is one number one and and i'm going to turn this one over to michelle because i think she's the best one to highlight this message but the, the first thing is to get vaccinated i think that's the key message get vaccinated we are saying don't hesitate vaccinate get vaccinated and number two is we're saying if you feel uncomfortable in any scenario any situation where you have uh not uncertainty about who's around you and if they're vaccinated or not vaccinated or if you feel that uh, you're in a maybe just a little bit more crowded of a situation that you otherwise feel uh, uncomfortable um put that mask on keep that mask on and uh lacy said it very rightfully so this is a transition period and any time during this pandemic whenever we've had a transition period it has been uh, it, it's taken some time to adjust, not just from the rules of the game or the requirements or stipulations, but also our own behaviors that, that go into that. Again, and those who are not uh, vaccinated, you are required to wear a mask. And I think that is, I can't say that any more strongly than, than, than that is met. If you are unvaccinated, you are required to wear a mask. And that is how you protect not just yourself, but those around you, not just your loved ones, but even strangers that are around you. And so we will require you to wear a mask if you are unvaccinated, but ultimately we wanna encourage you to get vaccinated. Michelle, do you wanna add anything to that message? I'll add that really the pandemic and ending this pandemic depends on all of us. So um, Dr. Shaw said the mask guidance is clear. The ability and the opportunity to remove your mask um, indoors and outdoors is for fully vaccinated people two weeks after your dose, um, last dose of vaccine. And all of us know the prevention ma measures. There is not anything that public health can do on our own. It is about our community and about all of us. And we're going to have to do this together. So we do need people to follow the mask rules. We do need people to be vaccinated and get in line. There are doses of vaccine for you. There's places like ARF who are going to help address your unique situations and your and your needs and help sure make community has trusted messengers and to, to help them through the process. But we are in it together and to, to really win and to um, kind of create our new normal, we're all going to have to do our part. And if people are going to game the system, that is really just going to um, impact all of us in our long-term recovery. It's going to impact our economic recovery. And so I would just say, shame on them. Um, and we need to do our part to um, keep our neighbors and our community protected. All right, our next question comes from Ariel with the spokesman. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious what is being done to support local health districts and departments that don't have the staff right now to offer mobile vaccine clinics in some of these smaller towns and communities that don't have healthcare providers or don't have um, vaccine distribution in their own communities. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. Um, we're uh, again, as I mentioned, we're we're working uh, on uh, some behind the scenes uh, activities, which I, I, I believe we're probably about a week away from from unveiling um, really about outreach and and really work that we're going to be doing with, from a DOH standpoint, in addition to what we're already doing. Lacey, Michelle, do you guys want to or Dan? I, I don't know if any of you want to take this one. Well, I mean, I can add beyond the expansion uh, and com community-based vans that, um, you know, we'll be sharing more about in the future. We already have uh, a number of mobile teams that are staffed by volunteers, National Guard, DOH employees, other state employees, and some contractors, and they're deployed and around the state and available to counties that need that support. 
um, within their community. I also will say that some of our vaccine partners have increased capacity now that um, the demand has shifted a little bit and are willing to do clinics in their communities. So if there is a local jurisdiction that needs that support, please reach out to the State Department of Health and we'll do some matchmaking with you to get you connected. There, There is plenty of capacity to administer vaccines in our state. There is ample supply of vaccine in our state. Um, we are in the phase of the pandemic we, where we are getting um, the vaccine to the people and the communities who need them. So pl please, please, if you need that capacity or supply, reach out to us and we will help. Frangie, we'll keep going given that we've got uh, a few more questions. How many do we have in the queue? We've got four questions left. All right, we'll go fast and we'll try to get all of them. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Tom with Public Radio. Good morning. Thanks for uh, hanging in there with us. I have a, I wonder if one or more of you could briefly chew over the concept of community immunity with us. Um, I got interested in this yesterday when I tried to find the place in Washington with the highest uh, vaccination rate and they're several candidates um, that would probably definitely be over the threshold of community immunity, like Point Roberts, where the fire chief said they're 75 to 80 percent fully vaccinated, or the city of Sammamish, which is at 91 percent of adults with at least one dose, or San Juan County, I think I saw it's at 76 percent uh, over age 16 with at least one shot. So is herd immunity meaningful, though, at the level of a smaller city or a rural county or individual zip code, given how many people come and go, or is there maybe a false sense of security there? Thanks, Tom. You know, I, I will tell you that um, it, it's important to remember, first of all, um, you know, when, when you when you name off like a Sammamish, maybe that's where uh, my wife and I should be getting our home, is uh, when you say 90%, that sounds like a great place to be protected. But I think it's important for us to remember that it's not just about that individual place where people reside. It's a very complicated way that everybody moves around, right? Where you live, where you learn, uh, where you work, you know, all sorts of places. Uh, health happens where you live, learn, work, worship, and play. And so we're all over communities. And so just because you have a high vaccination rate where you live, you really want, if you work like three, you know, three doors down, three counties down or, or what have you, that you, you, you can potentially still be at risk. And so I do think it's important and we want to encourage everybody to have the highest vaccination rates uh, within their communities. And certainly over time, uh, I'm hopeful that we do not see a tale of two cities or a tale of two states or a tale of two nations in our, 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 our state of Washington where people are really starting to see, you know, the, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated communities, because that is going to really be awful if we start to, to see incredible inequities when it comes to uh, who is being hospitalized. And so cities and counties and communities that actually have higher vaccination rates, they've received, or they've achieved some sort of community immunity. And the ones who have not are, are actually continuing to be seeing their community members in hospitals. That would be horrible. And we do not want to see that. So that's, that's really, Tom, in a, in a kind of a nutshell, it is important, but I think it's also complex because we don't just stay in the community that we are uh, we are obviously living in, and that's how we we measure uh, vaccination um, uh, rates is is by residents. So I do want to just make sure that caveat is in place. Rangie. All right, our next question comes from Abby with the News Tribune. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I think as guidelines continue to change, one place that people are, of course, nervous to still be in is the workplace where they're interacting with not only coworkers, but maybe, you know, um, consumers or people in the public. So I was curious, what advice do you have for people who are in the workplace and may not know the vaccine status of their coworkers that they're around for days and perhaps long hours? 
Yeah, I, I think the advice is first of all, wait a couple of few days because we're gonna be uh, providing some additional guidance, uh, again, working with LNI and the governor's office. So just stay tuned. Uh, but I would also say that in general, you know, we know that workplaces are going to do right by their employees. We hope they're gonna do right by not just their employees, but also the people that frequent their businesses and establishments. And if they're if they're in a sector that's working with the public, that they're gonna do the by, right by everybody that's part of that ecosystem. Um, and you know, where you feel that your business or your uh, leadership is not doing that, that you know, have a conversation with them and say, look, you know, I'm I'm worried about my my um, health or my safety or those of my colleagues around me. And then also be the champion of of the right practices, right? If you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, make sure you absolutely are wearing your mask and staying away from others. Uh, but if you are vaccinated, also be respectful of those around you. And so, particular again, just to reminder of uh, the fact that if I'm in a restaurant, um, I uh, tend to try to keep the, the mask on when the waiter comes or the, or the waitress comes to, to serve me, not, not because I, I'm going to necessarily uh, transmit virus to that individual, but just out of respect for that individual coming to, to be around. So I try to do that, it, it, you know, maybe not a hundred percent, I do the best I can, but I will tell you that, you know, we want people to be as respectful. So just think about the, the you know, the rules of the room. And I think that's really the, the key message from us. All right, our next question comes from Cheryl with the Columbia Basin Herald. All right, we're having um, a little bit of difficulty unmuting Cheryl. Um, Cheryl, we'll come back to you. Let's go to Steve with King Five. One moment. Go ahead, Steve. Good morning. Uh, so quick question, uh, King County, uh, the uh, public health, Seattle and King County, uh, they are encouraging mask wearing and uh, plan to issue actual guidance at some point uh, this week, as early as today, possibly tomorrow. Uh, my questions are this one, uh, just your thoughts on 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 King County uh, taking this this step. And then two, being that uh, there's such a high vaccination rate in the state comparatively um why why not have similar rules in place for the entire state uh steve i'm not sure i understood the <clears throat> second part of um so basically if if the, the the argument in King County is the the vaccination rates and uh, are, are still too low and uh, transmission rate is still too high for us to not be wearing masks. Um, if if that's the the call in King County, could we possibly see similar calls statewide, or are we going to leave that up to the counties? Got it. Um, so first of all, uh, we've been in touch with um, uh, Public Health uh, Seattle King County. I had a discussion with um, uh, Patty Hayes just yesterday afternoon about uh, about this issue and a couple of other things. You know, I will say that, uh, look, at the end of the day, we are also going to be supportive of what's happening in our local health jurisdictions. And, you know, um, uh, there is there is a, a mutual respect that really comes out of this. Uh, you know, we we obviously are following the, the guidance that we received from the CDC uh, last week, and we do feel that we are making the right call from a statewide standpoint, but that does not mean that local jurisdictions and or establishments uh, cannot go further uh, when it comes to requirements. And certainly without seeing the final uh, requirements or guidance that's that's being put out from, from King County, I obviously can't uh, comment further on it, but I will say that we are going to be uh, providing additional guidance by the end of this week. So we're already planning on doing something by the end of this week, which I think would help clarify that. Now, the other piece about statewide, as you mentioned, is that, you know, we are, you know, it is a challenge for us from a statewide standpoint when you're in a local community. And I've, you know, been 17 years in a local community as, as the as the fighting on the front lines. Uh, it is a different perspective when you are just with the uh, although there's heterogeneity, there's there's still more one community that you're dealing with versus having a number of different communities that are large, small, geographically different with different uh, community contexts and sociodemographics. And so we believe this is the right 
decision for the statewide approach and certainly now watching and, and working with our local partners on what they may do uh, if they do do something differently or more uh, restrictive. Thanks, Steve, for that question. All right, we did have the one other question. Um, we're having a little technical difficulty, so we will catch up with um, the reporter after our conversation here and follow up. This concludes yeah. the question and answer segment of our briefing today. And now we'll go to Secretary Shaw for closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Frangie. I, I wanted to just really quickly just give the Reverend a, a, a moment if she wanted to just make a, a last uh, a moment comment. I know she's uh, new to our briefing, but uh, she had some incredibly powerful and inspiring words uh, when she was describing the efforts. And certainly I want to give her a standing ovation, but uh, I, I'm sitting, so it's kind of hard to do that, but I'll, I'll at least do this. Uh, Reverend, would you want to make any any comments to, to close, and then I'll make a couple of additional ones. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I so appreciate the time that you've allowed our Earth to be on today. And I just want to, you know, um, applaud the work that is being done at, um, you know, at the state level, the Department of Health and in King County. Uh, we have found, um, you know, the, the um, support to be just to be incredible of, of, of all the different partners working together. Even though we are, Earth is a faith-based um, nonprofit and, you know, they're, there are all of these kind of guidelines about, you know, how we work together, but the synergy has been great. Uh, the partnerships across, you know, sectors, whether it be uh, with our public sector, sector or in the health industry, as well as the community has just been phenomenal. And, and it's something that I encourage, you know, uh, all community-based organizations to really get on board with. I know that many are, but, you know, as has been said, we are in this together and it is going to take uh, the, us working together uh, to actually make, uh, make this uh, vaccine, this pandemic, this epidemic, uh, just be to put it behind us so we can get to the new normal. So thank you again. You know, uh, the reason I wanted you to say something is because I didn't want to repeat anything and you said it all. So I have nothing else to say, but let's just keep moving forward. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you to our thank team. You. Thank you to all of our media partners. And just again, thank you to our community members during these difficult times. Frangie, we'll turn it back to you. All right. This concludes today's media availability. I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today and TVW for hosting today's live stream and archives of past briefings. Thank you all and take care.